Well, good afternoon and welcome back for the conclusion of our 13th presidential conference focusing on the Barack Obama presidency. I again want to thank Mina Bose and Athelene Collins and everyone involved in organizing this conference and our panelists and our discussants for making the conference so interesting and so informative. Let's just give everybody a round of applause. <laughs> Hofstra University is proud to have a long history of analyzing the role of the presidency by holding a, con a conference on each president. The purpose of this conference is to begin to begin to take stock from many different points of view of a presidential administration after some time has passed. It also connects our students to government leaders, policymakers, historians, and media professionals who have shaped, guided, and influenced the President of the United States. Now, I am still relatively new to Hofstra, new enough that I had not attended a presidential conference before, and I have been absolutely blown away by this event, by the distinct distinctiveness and distinction of the participants, the level of the presentations and the conversations, and really the smoothness of the whole operation. And since this is my last time standing before you at this meeting, I want to thank everybody here for coming and for sharing your experience and your expertise with the Hofstra community and with each other. I hope that you leave Hofstra having had a stimulating and enjoyable experience and that you will come back and visit us again. In concluding the conference, it's only fitting that we hear from somebody who was one of President Obama's closest advisors. Ms. Valerie Jarrett served as senior advisor to President Barack Obama from 2009 to 2017, making her one of the longest serving senior advisors to a president in history. Prior to joining the Obama White House, Ms. Jarrett held roles in the public and the private sectors. She has practiced law, and she has served as the chief executive officer of a real estate development company in Chicago. She has worked for two mayors of Chicago as deputy corporation counsel for Mayor Harold Washington and as deputy chief of staff for Mayor Richard M. Daley. And she was the commissioner of planning and development for the city of Chicago. She's also served as chairwoman of the board of trustees of the University of Chicago and the University of Chicago Medical Center. Ms. Jarrett's connection with the Obamas began when she recruited Michelle Obama, who was actually Michelle Robinson, to work with her in Mayor Daley's office. Ms. Jarrett would later witness and be a key player in much of what we have learned about over the past few days, about how the president shaped his leadership team, approached policymaking, developed legislative and foreign policy priorities, made decisions, and dealt with the press. Thank you, Dr. Jarrett, for, for a meeting with us today. We are also delighted to welcome back to Hofstra Douglas Brinkley. Dr. Brinkley was previously a faculty member at Hofstra, and he is now the Catherine Sonoff Brown Chair in Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University. He also serves as the presidential historian for the New York Historical Society and is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. The author of award-winning books, Dr. Brinkley is a member of the advisory board for the Obama Presidency Oral History Project at Columbia University. We will look to Ms. Jarrett and Dr. Brinkley to help us reflect on what we have learned and begin to understand what might define the Obama legacy as time goes on. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Bose to begin our program. Thank you. Thank you, President Poser. It is truly an honor to be on the stage with Doug Brinkley and Valerie Jarrett. Um, Doug and I spoke uh, a couple of years ago about this conference and he said, no matter what, he would be here. And so I knew we could count on that. 
And Valerie, uh, your office confirmed with us, I can actually remember the time in the afternoon on in December that you were interested in coming. And that was when kind of my heart skipped a beat and I said, this conference is going to come together. <laughs> so it is just truly a delight. I have a series of questions that I want to ask. And I was going to ask at the I was going to start at the end, but I think I'm actually going to start at the beginning, even though this is the third day of the conference, and we've discussed President Obama's communication style, his historic election in 2008, his policymaking, leadership. But I'd like to, um, Valerie, if I may begin with you, um, you write in your beautiful memoir, Finding My Voice, you said that when you heard Barack Obama delivered the keynote address in 2004 at the Democratic Convention in Boston. That was the first time that you fully appreciated his extra, extraordinary ability to connect, to make each of us feel he was speaking directly to us, to see ourselves in his story. And I believe you had known him and uh, Michelle Obama before they became the Obamas um, for more than a decade before that. And could you share a little bit about how, you write about this in your memoir and you've spoken about it, but how you saw Barack Obama's leadership abilities develop from the state Senate to running for the U.S. Senate, to winning election to the U.S. Senate, to running for president? All right, that's a, that's a big question. So first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be here. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Let's try again. It is such a pleasure for me to be here. And to all of you in the audience, thank you for having an interest in what I consider to be a very historic presidency. And uh, your participation and engagement is heartening because it's exactly what we like to see. So you're going back to the year um, 2004. And I actually met them uh, not a decade earlier because they would have been practically babies, but a few years earlier into in um, 1991. So yeah, I guess you're right, close to a decade. And so I interviewed Michelle Van Robinson to uh, for a job in uh, the mayor's office, and she was incredible. And she didn't talk about her resume, and she didn't talk about any of her accomplishments. She saw her resume on my desk. She figured I could read. She told me her story, and now it's, of course, the quintessential American story. Uh, growing up on the south side of Chicago, working class family, uh, parents who hadn't gone to college but valued hard work and education and willing to sacrifice for she and her brother to get a great education. And at the, this point in her life, she was a couple years out of law school, working in a big firm, and I had worked at a large firm as well and had been very disenchanted by it and felt that it wasn't really going to lead to me having a purposeful life. And so I said, why now? Why do you want to consider leaving this extraordinary law firm? And she said that her father and her best friend had died the prior year and that it was such a wake-up call. And it made her appreciate that life is finite and that she should take her skill set and do something really useful with it. And I had left my law firm soon after I had a baby. And my mom had always worked, and I was really proud of her. And working in my law firm, I thought, is this baby ever going to be proud of anything I do? So we kind of bonded on that. Give her an offer on the spot. Talk to her a couple of days later. What about it? She said, well, my fiancé doesn't think it's a good idea. And that's what I said. And then who cares who your fiancé is? And what <laughs> he thinks. And she laughed like you are, and she said, well, his name is Barack Obama, and he started his career as a community organizer, and he's not that thrilled about me going and working in local government in a political office in the mayor's office. Would you be willing to have dinner with us? And quite wisely, in retrospect, I said yes. And I mentioned this story just to give you the sense of the arc of our relationship, which is now 32 years, um, to answer your question. But at the end of this dinner, where we, he's was very curious. He asked me all kinds of questions about myself, and he talked about himself, and they talked about uh, their lives together and what they wanted to do. And he had just finished law school and was trying to figure out what he wanted to do, but he's, he had this yearning for public service. And the direction it would take, he had no idea. And at the end of this dinner, I was convinced of two things. Number one, that they would get married and be married forever. I thought they will grow old as old souls together, not only because you could feel the love and affection, but the respect. They listened to each other. They asked very um, provocative questions of me, and you could just tell that they were in this as, as a couple, and that people have often said to me, well, why did she need to have her fiance's permission to go take a job? 
And I said, because over the time I have known them, and he has made a lot of really important decisions about his career, not a single one happened without her sitting right next to him. So it was reciprocal. The second thing I thought at the end of dinner was one day, I bet he could be mayor of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so he reminds me on a regular basis that he has I, uh, certainly um, gone beyond my expectations of him. <laughs> but I did think that he had this yearning and ability to connect with people. And he was such a good listener and he was so thoughtful and obviously smart and really only interested in a career in public service. And, and he started out doing civil rights, being a civil rights lawyer, and that's a form of public service. And um, a few years later, of course, he runs for the state Senate, and I was very excited about that. And then he ran for Congress, and I thought that was, okay, kind of stretching, and he lost. Then he wanted to run for the U.S. Senate, and I said, that's a terrible idea. Yeah. And Michelle Obama had a breakfast at my home with a couple of friends trying to convince him not to do this. And at the end of the breakfast, he had us completely on board with it. And so I think each step of the way, one, the way I suppose I would answer it best is that being in all these positions, including the president, hasn't changed him. And now to quote his wife, it simply revealed who he was all along. And with each test, I think we all saw a little bit further about what he could do. And I would say in those eight years that he was president, and I think my colleagues who were in the administration here uh, Nancy Ann and Phil would agree, there wasn't a single day where he was unprepared. And I think that's part of this sense that this isn't about him, it's about service and his true north. I do think tone starts at the top. His true north was, how can I be in service? How can I take my skills and apply them to be in service? And that's been a constant throughout. Thank you. Doug, I was wondering if you'd offer your thoughts President Obama came on the political scene with such a surprise, right, in 2004, for many of us who are outside Chicago. And I think the mayor, there is a mayor's race this year, so he... <laughs> so we're, so we have a new <laughs> but, um, Doug, would you offer your thoughts on kind of when Barack Obama became a political force? What, was it 2004? Did you see it earlier? Or what did you see leading up to I 2008? I think 2004, I had um, wrote a cover story for the Atlantic Monthly on John Kerry in the Vietnam War. And Senator Kerry's running for president. He gave me his, his journals, letters, diaries from Vietnam. And I did a book called Tour of Duty about Kerry winning three Purple Hearts, Bronze Star, Silver Star, and it uh, ended up becoming a, if you all recall, the swift boat flap of that year. Um, I went to the convention with uh, a little bus group uh, from the, the Kennedy Library and was with Ted Sorensen, standing in the audience with Ted, whose eyes, the great speechwriter for John F. Kennedy. And, um, you know, we were there for the convention and everybody, you know, Kerry did his reporting for duty speech and it was good. But Barack Obama at Boston was breathtaking. And at that moment, I mean, I, you, I had heard uh, rumors, murmurs about what a talented person he is. And uh, the speech was just epic. And, and it's rare at a political convention that a speech is that dominant. I, I suppose uh, Ronald Reagan in 1964, when he spoke at the Cow Palace out in San Francisco or out in San Francisco for that speech outshadowed Barry Goldwater in some way. But um, but a, a funny story after that uh, convention speech, where I interviewed Harry Reid, and Harry had the honor of being part of the introduction that day. And after the speech, um, Harry told me he couldn't believe that, how good. And he said, uh, he told me he went to uh, Barack Obama and said, unbelievable, I can't believe how good you were. And he, he put his arm on him and said, uh, Harry, um, I'm very talented at this. <laughs> 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 it's in a joking way, but it, it was, uh, you know, like he, I think if from this conference, we might underestimate his ability to move people through oratory because we talk about Kennedy, we talk about Reagan, but Barack Obama in a room, you can just feel the energy and everybody leaning forward and uh, it's, it's remarkable. And then I think he also came into sharper focus, not only with as a writer and we were, you know, he'd go to book festivals and the like, but at Springfield, Illinois, when on uh, February 10th, 2017, 
at the very spot where in 1858, Abraham Lincoln gave the House divided speech, he announced his, his run for the presidency and, and wrapping himself in that uh, Lincoln legacy while doing it. And that was a great speech, but I went back and looked at it in preparation for today. And he had fulfilled all the promises of that speech, which were to get out of Iraq, to start creating new ways of um, uh, energy independence, which is tough, um, to take on the war on terror. And you have the killing of Osama bin Laden and, and most importantly, reforming health care. And so you can see promises kept in the old Kennedy, Robert Frost phrase, you know, of, of um, Obama as early as 17, uh, what he ran on and then he ended up fulfilling after his two-term presidency. Yeah, no, from February 2007 to January 2017, everything that was laid out in that speech was uh, was completed in the two terms. That's actually a very nice um, transition, I think, to the presidency. And um, I thought I'd start with, um, Valerie, your official title um, was Senior Advisor to the President and Director of the Office of Engagement and Intergovernmental Affairs for all eight years, January 20th, 2009, January 20th, 2017. Um, how did how did President Obama's leadership style develop or change from from campaign Senate campaign to the presidency? Well, look, I think the basic human being is is who he is. He's curious. He's a good listener. He believed in encouraging his team to push him to make sure he made not just the best decision but the most informed decision. And the most precious thing a president has is time. And so he assembled a cabinet and a White House that reflected the rich diversity of our country. And he went and he tried to find the smartest people he could with subject matter expertise, but also people who shared his values and put them through a very um, disciplined process of developing policies and then making recommendations to him. And as I said before, he knew that as president, he had to be prepared every single day. And I used to often get calls from his wife saying, you're killing my husband. He's up until two in the morning. What are you all doing? And in fact, we would send very thick briefing packages up every night. And he always felt the sense of having to walk in the room and be prepared and to show respect for the people who with whom he was working, but also respect to you, the American people, that he appreciated that the decisions he was making were gonna affect billions of lives. And so I would say the change that I saw in him was a maturity, a comfort level, making decisions where oftentimes he would say, when are you gonna bring me the easy decisions? And we're like, oh no, we made those. We, <laughs> you get like between bad and really, really bad, and you try to figure out which one is worse. Uh, but the complications of those decisions and the, and the ability in the course of the day to go from foreign policy to domestic policy to engagement to a state dinner or to a, you know, a science fair, I mean, all of that and being able to be present and engaged in, and convey to people authentically that you care about them and what they have to say and, that, and their interests. And part of my job was to bring in a variety of stakeholders to make sure that he was making these informed decisions, not just giving his, him our best counsel and advice, but the mayors, the governors, the county elected officials, a whole range of different constituency groups. Last counted, I think we had like 62 different constituency groups, often who would disagree with one another. And then of course, the people we call the real people. That would have been all of you. And so if we were working on health care with Phil and Nancy Ann, we would bring in, you know, a mom whose child was sick and didn't have health insurance and she's trying to figure out how am I gonna take care of my child's needs or someone who lost their job and and therefore didn't have the ability to have insurance as well. And so so that was really the way he would absorb information and he was always willing to wait on making a decision until he had all of the information he needed. And we tried to do a very good job of reaching a consensus when we would come to him. And if he thought, no, I, I need these 10 more bits of information, he thought nothing of saying, go back and come back when you have it. And then when it was time to make a decision, he made a decision. He did not enjoy just admiring a problem or having a conversation for a sake of conversation. He was all about getting the job done but on his terms when he was ready and he thought he was prepared to absorb the responsibility of those decisions and the effect it had on all of us. Thank you. 
Um, Doug, you said that during the Obama presidency, you met with President Obama several times. I know I have your Rolling Stone interview from 2012 right here. But could you start by maybe offering some of your reflections on President Obama, what you observed? I mean, you've written so many books. What stands out about President Obama's leadership style, particularly in comparison to other modern presidents? I think his integrity is sky high. Uh, he is a truth sayer. He, he does not lie. He tries to be as honest and direct in his individual dealings. He's also very book smart, very pop culture smart, knows everything about international affairs. So in that way, he's a bit intimidating uh, because he, he's he's... He's a fully composed person at the peak of his game. Um, but, he, you know, I think he had some one of the what people at this conference we were to, some of the scholars were talking about. He would, you know, he he wanted to be a great president. He already had made history by being the first black president. They, you know, we all grew up with all white men and suddenly Barack Obama and that put him into a category with Frederick Douglass or Booker T. Washington or Harriet Tubman, I mean, or, you know, a, a list in African-American history. But he already had achieved that by winning the White House. But I think the really wanting to show good governance and make the right pragmatic decisions, but not lose the part of uh, idealism that had motivated him as a community organizer or when he you know, was talking about, yes, we can, and Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and all that. He didn't want to lose that, um, that side of him. Uh, I, I felt that he, um, he's a mount, he got very interested in my, Valerie's with him daily, so, you know, he, but my talks about presidents with him, he got very interested in Theodore Roosevelt's use of executive power. Because Dr. Mitch, Mc, Mc, uh, Mitch McDonald said that he won't do, um, any um, business with Obama, that their whole Republican policy was to just not do business with Obama. Obama got very interested in the way um, TR had circumvented that. And you will find traces of Theodore Roosevelt and Barack Obama, the, where the Osawatomie, Kansas speech, a rollout of health care, or when he signs millions of acres for national monuments, you know, at Bears Ears and, and, uh, and San Juan Islands and elsewhere. Um, and then he seemed very interested in Dwight Eisenhower's uh, foreign policy approach, uh, meaning really creating a foreign policy that was coherent. Uh, I think we, I, I encountered a president that had already won a Nobel Peace Prize in the White House. He was a global superstar, but yet when he gave his Nobel Peace Prize speech, it's largely about national security and the need to prevent terrorism. Uh, he could have easy, easily kind of pandered and given a more Gandhi, um, you know, approach speech, but he really wanted to show the need to protect dem democratic values around the world in a time of transition. Um, incredibly funny. And, um, you know, I would meet with him with historians, Robert Caro and Doris Kearns Goodwin, and talk about, presidents, but he is interested in them all. Ronald Reagan interested him at, um, you know, um, I was mentioning earlier at one clumsy moment with Michelle, they were asking, how did Reagan, who was an ardent conservative, uh, how did he win over people in a kind of consensus way that he had en enemies? And when I said, well, he was shot. <laughs> it was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Meaning Reagan was president only a few months more and he was recuperating. So the kind of country turned to him to heal. And 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 it, I felt awkward with an answer like that. But, um, you know, um, but he, he, the real takeaway is just how knowledgeable he is on books, 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 how much he reads. What in a, a rare that our society produced somebody with the qualities of Barack Obama, the mixed qualities and. Now, after the Trump years, I'm looking at all of the kind of malfeasance in government, uh, the way that he ran a clean ship, a clean house, had great administrators. And Barbara Perry and I were talking earlier and, um, about women and how many women he brought into the White House and, and not in a way, oh, I better, not the Mitt uh, Romney binder of women approach. 
It was genuinely finding the talented women and bringing them into the forefront of the administration and getting two women, um, you know, uh, Keegan and, um, and, and, and um, Santa Bayora uh, as um, in, the, in the Supreme Court and having Valerie in uh, decisions. And, and so that side of him looks, looks incredible. There never been a president that has given, brought women into administration, I think, in such a, a, uh, an authentic and meaningful way. And he's a role model. That photo lives forever, right, of the little boy getting his, his head touched, that you could have hair like me and, and be president, and the way he was kind of always putting being a dad and a husband and raising his kids uh, first and foremost. So he, he didn't just talk family values. He exemplified it, and by doing so, left a very proud legacy in that, and, and as in somebody who I think has the qualities of being a sustainable hero. Well, it's hard to come back. That, that's pretty darn good. But, <laughs> yes. but I just want to add a couple of things, because I agree everything you said, obviously, Doug, but I think there's a piece of his leadership that was also respect for other people's ideas. And once he was elected president, he wasn't elected, he didn't view himself as president of just the people who voted for him. He viewed himself as president of the country. And it was important to him to earn the trust of the American people every single day. He didn't take it for granted at all. Another point I would make in terms of his management style is, is that he wanted to know who had the best idea. That may not be the cabinet member or his senior staff. It may be somebody five tiers down who actually did the work and produced the work. And we would often sit in either the Oval Office or the Roosevelt Room, which was very hierarchical. So cabinet and senior staff sit around the table and then around the edges would be the people who actually did a lot of the work. And you could see him often like leaning around the cabinet person and saying, well, what do you think? And if you had the nerve to disagree with him, then you, caught what I, you got what I call the full Obama. He would lean in and he'd go, well, that's interesting. Tell me why. Because he fully understood power. And the power dynamic and the discrepancy, he knew it was upon him to make people feel comfortable so they could tell him what they really thought and that he would make a better decision if they felt comfortable enough to disagree. And that is an extraordinary gift. And then the final point I would make on uh, what Doug said about his team is that the, at the end of his last term, uh, this is post the election, so you know, everybody was feeling a little um, uh, depressed to say the very least, and it's our last dinner where he had his senior staff in his cabinet. And he stood up to say you know, words to the team and he, his voice almost started to crack immediately. And he said, when I look around this room and I think about all we accomplished, and we accomplished so much over eight years, what I am most proud of is that we didn't have a single scandal, that you didn't do anything to embarrass the American people, not him, the American people. And he said, I am so proud of that. And the fact that you, you, you weren't just the best players on the field, which is how you might have started out, but that you became the best team. And that is a part of, I think, his legacy and the role model that we would hope that young people in particular would look to and say, that's the way a president should behave. Yeah. If I may pick up on that point, I'm jumping a little ahead with my questions, but we have so many students in the audience, many of whom um, hopefully will pursue careers in public service in some form. Many students we've discussed over the conference, alums who came back who saw Barack Obama in the 2008 and 2012 presidential debates at Hofstra and were motivated to enter politics and engage because of his political participation. What, what lessons would you say? Integrity, smarts, these are important qualities. What lessons would you say that President Obama's political career provides for students today who are thinking about a future in politics? Well, keep in mind it was never about him. It was always about we, what we could do together. I think part of the reason why his speech in 2004 was so inspiring, I will say I was really nervous when he first started speaking because this is a big crowd and I've, you know, I've never seen him do anything quite like that before. And after about 30 seconds, I was just like everybody else. I was captivated by it. It's because everybody 
he, he identified in that speech what we have in common and not what our differences are. And I think people are still hungry for that sense of connection, sense of belonging, sense of being a part of something bigger and more important than themselves. And I think that's what he had the ability to inspire in a whole generation of young people who finished college and went right from college to Iowa or New Hampshire or someplace they'd never been in life before and built a relationship with people on the ground and realized that it is through that old-fashioned community organizing that somebody with the, let, with the name Barack Obama, a skinny kid from the south side of Chicago, a first-term senator, could win the presidency. And he often said, this isn't about me. It's about all those young people out there who believed in something bigger and more important than themselves and who are willing to have hard conversations with people in communities who had no idea who Barack Obama was. And it was through their efforts that, he, that they introduced Barack Obama to the community. And that connection and those relationships, that was so very important to him. And look, the um, current climate, it is a lot harder to communicate. Social media dominates the toxicity in our political, political discourse. But one of the many reasons why I enjoy running his foundation is that part of his legacy is at this foundation, which is helping build that next generation of leaders, giving them the skills that they need to go forth and change the world and to believe that a person who can change a room can change a city and can change a state and can change the world. And that, that power that we all have inside of each and every one of us is what I think he would want the young people in this, in this um, auditorium and those listening online to appreciate is the incredible power that you have and that we the people mean something. Our government will only be as good as you demand it be, that you hold your elected officials accountable. And if you get in the arena, the best thing that could happen would be that somebody would describe you the way Doug described President Obama, somebody with character and integrity and who kept sight of why he was really there. That's very inspiring. You know, there's no way to underestimate how important that community service um, stint is in Chicago, in my mind, because he really got involved. And that's where the young people uh, need to get out there with voter registration drives and be part of democracy, believe in it. And if you have a political science gene or government or, or if you're a STEM person, get out there and not only vote yourself, but convince others and peers to. And uh, I think th that experience of knocking on doors, of being there and talking to people, this, and, and that was part of a Chicago tradition. Saul Linsky had created a whole um, concept of it there, which incidentally gets adopted by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and others on how you can increase voter registration. If you follow if you, how you can do it, I mean, Chavez becomes the great, you know, Latinx figure because he went out and would say in um, San Jose, California, let's register, you know, um, Lati uh, Latinx people or, or Mexican Americans in his day. Let's get farm workers ready to vote because then we have power. There's power in the vote. And that's a, that's a consistent theme in his life. And as ex-president, I would think in my limited conversations, but in my conversations with them, getting young people engaged with democracy and voting and believing in our country. And you could see how important it is now when our, we're seeing our democracy in peril. Uh, we're, fi we're finding that our, our institutions are fraying, that there's a lot of conspiracy theories and misinformation and apathy among voters that uh, things don't matter and it's all rigged. And so the message of Barack Obama is this is a great country. We can make a difference. I came up from nowhere. I came up from very humble uh, origins and lived up to that Horatio Alger uh, story to be president. And you can, too, and understand your own self-worth, but execute your self-worth uh, by, by getting others to participate. Uh, he's about the community. Uh, and, you know, Dr. King called it the beloved community. Uh, and Barack Obama, is, is, it has that uh, side to him also. Uh, I, I, I think he is more about the people than he is about himself. Much more, much more so. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell a quick story to Doug's point. When, um, when President Obama created the 21st Century Task Force on Policing, 
he uh, invited in a few of the demonstrators who'd been demonstrating around the country, beginning in Ferguson after Michael Brown's death. And there were about six or seven of them. And they came into the Oval. And if you can imagine, here you are, a young demonstrator, and you've been out in the community, and, and then you're suddenly in the Oval Office with the President of the United States, but you're, a little, you're more than just a little angry and frustrated by government, but then he's the President of the United States, and he looks like you. And, and so they were go you could just see their heads going through this. And at the end of the meeting where they were telling him all these things that they're demanding, he said, stop focusing on world peace. Just find something small and get that done and then find something else and get that done, and get that done, and don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. But then the other thing he said to them, and this is what I really wanna to say to the young people, it's hard work over a sustained period of time. That's how change happens. It doesn't, you're lucky if you get to be there for the thunderbolt, but most people are just the foot soldiers that lay ground for thunderbolts that happen decades later. And appreciating where you are in that kind of long arc of history is something I think that is harder and harder for young people to do because everything is happening so quickly. Technology has connected you, you're smarter, you're better organized, you have the ability to be so much more impactful, but you are a little impatient. And so, you know, have that fierce urgency of now, but also <laughs> recognize that change just, you know, Bill was talking about hope and change. Hope and change are hard. These are not, you know, light words. They are words that require that sustained effort. And then, and then it's worth it. Yeah. Well, as you described that, I'm reminded of the previous plenary where we heard in just in such thoughtful and dynamic detail how the Affordable Care Act came to be. And to hear from the White House side, from Phil and Nancy, Ann, Phil Shalero and Nancy Ann DeParl, and then from the Senate and House, Wendell, uh, Kate Leone and Wendell Primus, it, it brought it all to life. And I'm just wondering, you spoke, Valerie, of President Obama's preparation. He was always ready, the, 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 buy, the work that he received every night. And there were, yet there were so many obstacles. So how, how did he persevere through all of that. I mean, it, it, it would have been so easy, and I think Phil alluded to this earlier, it would have been so easy and some advised to maybe healthcare is too much, right? Hold off for a little bit. How did he kind of keep that laser focus on what he wanted to achieve? Well, there is an inner strength and there is an inner quietness that he has that gives him the ability to absorb a lot of pain. A very famous pastor once said to me when I was on a rampage about something, he said, part of leadership is learning how to absorb pain without it either debilitating you or making you numb. And I think President Obama had that ability because, again, it was never about him. He always saw himself as, look, I have these skills. How can I apply these skills to the greater good? And it is a noble calling. And I think that nobleness gives you some strength. And then the other factor is humor. And I was trying to get Phil, I was hoping Phil would tell a story earlier that has a little bit of humor, and I won't do justice to it, but Phil and I were in the Oval Office and Nancy Ann and a group of advisors, and to your point, Mina, a lot of folks were beginning to say, oh my gosh, is the Affordable Care Act worth it? You know, you're losing your political capital, everybody wants you to focus on the economy, and he understood the nexus between the Affordable Care Act and the economy as Nancy Ann laid out, but the American people didn't quite get it. And so people were beginning to say, well, maybe just children, or maybe just um, forget it. And Phil, what was your exact phrase, if you're feeling lucky? When it comes down to it, Mr. President, is it, do you feel lucky? And the reason he asked Phil is Phil, could figure out anything. If it wouldn't work this way, then try this way. And he called him third way Phil because Phil could <laughs> always figure out that third way. And so when Phil says to him, if you're feeling lucky, Mr. President, he gets up, President gets up from his chairs and we're all sitting on the other side of the oval from the Resolute desk. He walks over to the desk, behind the desk, he looks out at the lawn and he sees the little playground he'd built for Sasha and Malia and he, says to Phil, I think he started with Phil, where are we? And the president, and Phil said, Mr. President, we're in the Oval Office. <laughs> and um, the president said, that's right, Phil, we're in the Oval Office. He said, Phil, what's my name? And at this point, Phil is like very confused. And he said, <laughs> President Obama? And he goes, nope, my name is Barack Hussein Obama. You're asking me if I feel lucky? Of course I'm lucky. <laughs> And then he said, get back to work. And, and, and I should preface this by saying that we were so 
you know, exhausted and frustrated and angry. And here we are just trying to provide affordable health care to Americans. Why are the Republicans being so challenging? And he took that moment and he broke the ice and he said something hilarious, which also happened to be true. And he said, get back to work. And he had that ability to always lift people up and look for their better angels, find what we have in common, and and by example, get back to work. And he simply was relentless. And, and I should say, hasten to add, look, the Affordable Care Act didn't have anything, everything in it that we wanted. He called it a starter house. I mean, he could have held out for the public option, in which case we wouldn't have all the benefits that you heard from the earlier panel. He did the best he could do with the votes we had, and then he moved forward. And I think that's the kind of the secret sauce of a good president is to have a feel for when you've gone as far as you can get and then push it a little bit further and then declare victory and come back to fight another day. Uh, but but you, he would, he had no patience, for example, for cable television. If I would walk in his office and I'm exercised about something, he'd say, I know you're up there looking at cable in your office, get out of Washington, <laughs> get back in touch with the American people. And he had no patience for nonsense. He just would, he has the ability, continues to have the ability to just stay focused on what's important and try to push the ball forward, which is why part of what the foundation is doing timely right now is how do we strengthen our democracy? How do we get young people to feel engaged? How do we stop this rampant disinformation? How do we focus on inclusive capitalism where we're not just simply hollowing out the middle class? How do we bring ourselves to strengthen our institutions? And to you young people, you can't abandon those institutions. They are the foundation of a democracy. If you're unhappy with them, make them better. That's your job. And you know what, just to add to that, when I mean, he had, a, he, had a, he had to use a lot of political capital on the Affordable Care Act, in, but he had some. I mean, that we, it, it's amazing to think that when he won in 2008, he carried Florida, he carried North Carolina, Virginia, Iowa, Wisconsin, oh, yeah. Michigan. I mean, it's, and, and, I mean, a Democratic president, Barack Hussein Obama, winning that many states and, uh, Yet it was a intense time with the um, Great Recession, and we were, the big debate was how much stimulus um, should go into the economy. He had to uh, help General Motors survive a near-death situation for that um, important, iconic American automaker. And the Affordable Care Act, he did, he had the the gall really, or the 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 heart to say we're going to do it and push that forward with help from Nancy Pelosi and many others. But it, it came with the cost getting that done. I mean, you, that's where the Tea Party movement, of course, starts erupting in protest. And I love the fact you mentioned that Rolling Stone article. It reminded me that was when he was running against um, Romney. But I had asked him if he they were now mocking Affordable Care Act as Obamacare. And I thought he he would back off of that. He said, "Hey, they want to give me. They want to call it Obamacare. Call it Obamacare." Um, and he was right. I mean, it's a signature piece of the Obama presidency, the Affordable Care Act, and it's one that's tangible in the lives of our friends and our neighbors. It, it is really saved, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And so it's a, it's, it was a beautiful piece of legislation and. Look, people have wanted to do something like Affordable Care Act since Theodore Roosevelt tried it and couldn't. And but believe me, FDR wanted it and couldn't get it. And Truman tried it and they couldn't get it. And Johnson wanted it in the Great Society. So there have been an effort to do it, but he's the one who got it done. And now it's become, I think, a, um, a birthright, as surely as Social Security or Medicaid and Medicare. And so uh, it's right to, I think, when we laundry list Obama administration accomplishments to put the Affordable Care Act perhaps at the top of the list. Yeah. I, that, I agree, and that's as we've been discussing, and and the the full list of accomplishments, which we haven't even covered all of it, but just uh, we've 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 got a lot here, and we've addressed in the conference. We've talked about President Obama's leadership qualities and his commitment to public service, his personality, his thinking of others, his humor. I'd like to talk about representation for a moment, if we could, because I don't think any of us who uh, remember uh, election night 2008 will ever forget that 
what the significance of what that meant for American politics to elect the country's first black American president. And it, it, the images in Chicago, the, the victory, the euphoria, the excitement of, of what this meant for the country. And we know progress isn't always linear. Um, you know, there are steps forward. Valerie, you just spoke about the need of kind of pushing forward, right? And there are many disappointments. It's very hard. What, what does President Obama's election, as we kind of take the long view of history, how do we build upon that? How do we kind of c continue to expand opportunities for future presidents, public officials? Well, I'll tell you something about how he feels about that night. And look, uh, representation matters. I think not just for little black boys and girls, but for children all over our country, adults all over our country, it changed the definition of who could be president of the United States. And once that's happened, you can, that's forever. And there are, you know, I, I've, as we all have heard, countless stories of young people saying, oh, I'm gonna be president in a very matter of fact way because Barack Obama became president. And so I don't take away from that, but I would share with you, and I think this is important about his leadership, the night that the Affordable Care Act passed, um, I had gone home to watch it on television and I got a call uh, from the president's assistant. She said, he'd like everybody who worked on the Affordable Care Act to come back to the White House and watch it from the White House. And I was sitting with Susan Schur, who at that point was a lawyer in the council's office and had worked on health care. And we were in our PJs and uh, <laughs> she lived across the hall, bowl of popcorn. And I said, we're good, we're home. We'll watch it on television, fabulous. And she clears her throat and she said, perhaps you didn't hear me. <laughs> President Obama said he would like everybody who worked on it to come back. And I'm glad I did because he had everyone gathered in the rows of our room. Nancy Ann was there. And um, it was just a wonderful moment to see the vote. And then in a moment of spontaneity, and he's not that, you can't get, be that spontaneous when you're the president. He said, everybody come up to the Truman balcony and we're gonna celebrate. Well, there were a hundred people. Michelle Obama was out of town, which is how he got away with it. You can imagine <laughs> Secret Service going renegade plus 100 moving to the residence. <laughs> so we all go up to the residence and um, I, I won't say how many martinis he had had. I had had two <laughs> by about 2 a.m. And we were, I mean, it was wee hours. And it was an unseemly, it was a, not unseemly, it was an unseasonably warm spring night. And it felt a little like election night in Chicago in terms of temperature and spirit. And as Nancy Ann will remember, he went to every single person who was there from the most junior person on my staff responsible for finding the real people to then Vice President Biden. And with you know heartfelt presence, thank you so much for your effort. And he spent a very special moment with Nancy Ann without whom the Affordable Care Act would not have been passed. So Nancy Ann, thank you. The person in the White House who takes the least credit for anything, we were talking earlier about how she barely has any photos with President Obama because she would never have deigned to ask for anything like that. Anyway, I digress. He's telling Nancy Ann how meaningful it was that um, this passed. And Nancy Ann's beginning to be overwhelmed by all of this attention. So I sidled up to him to help out Nancy Ann. And I said to him, and we're standing on the Truman balcony, looking out over the South Lawn, the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial, you are like right in the midst of history. And I said to him, how do you feel tonight compared to how you felt election night? And without missing a beat, he said, there's no comparison. He said, election night was simply the means to get to tonight. And I thought, well, that's why you have so many people who understand your presidency, because again, it wasn't about you. Election night was you win an election so that you can then go do something really, really hard. And if you burn through your political capital and you don't win re-election and a hundred plus million people with pre-existing conditions and 40 million people have health care for the first time and no one can be discriminated against, is it worth it? If you are a true public servant, the answer is a simple yes. And so... Yes, representation matters, and it was important to him to have a cabinet that was diverse, and it was important to him for people to see people who look like them. And he understood that when you are the first, your bar is higher, which is why it was so essential that he not have scandals on his watch. But ultimately, those elections are just simply so you can do something good for the country. And that's how he looked at it. 
President Obama describes that night in his memoir. But I think, Valerie, you just did what the previous plenary did. You brought it to life. I, I almost feel like I'm holding a martini. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask, I don't want to take, I know there will be audience questions. I, I'd like to ask one question about archives and one question about the Obama Foundation, and then maybe we'll open, we'll open it up. Doug, we heard some discussion. You're on the Columbia Oral History Project Advisory Board, the Obama Foundation Advisory Board. We know that the National Archives, the five-year mark, just uh, uh, started in 2022 with the declassifications opening of President Obama's uh, records. And um, I believe someone on uh, earlier today, uh, I think it was, it was Phil or Nancy Ann, Nancy Ann, I think, spoke about how we'll see the logs of all the meetings that President Obama had. What else will the archival record? I mean, we, we can, don't have the documents yet, but how, as we get that, will that enrich our understanding of the president? Well, it's be so voluminous. I mean, we now have more, doc, you know, it's one thing to study John Adams' era and look at government documents <laughs> and look at America <laughs> in the 21st century, meaning so it, it's a lot of data points, a lot of materials. Um, and I, it'll be accessible. The one great part about digitalization is it allows people to do research from varied points all over the world. Um, you're going to be able, you're not going to always have to just go to Chicago to study um, these the documentation because mo most government papers today are being done digitally. And that was the, really the beginning. Remember the Blackberry with Obama? That was like his, <laughs> the big item. Well, since the Blackberry, that started, you know, a kind of wave. So I, I would look at what the President Obama's uh, Chicago Center um, um, from that archival point of view as a pioneering in a new way to be a depository for presidential archives, building on the great legacy that the National Archives uh, Records you know, Administration has created and taking it into the 21st century technological era. Yeah, and, we're, and I know that the um, director of the Presidential Center is here, and it will be opening in uh, its broken ground, and we're we'll very excited to see what that means for where, scholars. Where, where is Louise Bernard, Bernard is here. here. She's Louise? our curator. There Louise. she is. Hey, <laughs> Thank you, Louise, for being here. But 95% of our documents are digitized. I mean, that's un he's the first digital president, in a sense. And so rather than having a gigantic storage room of papers, we will have it digitized and therefore accessible. And part of what Louise is doing at the center is curating, well, which of the archives do we want to have at the Presidential Museum to tell the story of his presidency? And so you don't have to look through every single document. You, we will curate it for you and try to make it interactive so that people, when they finish going through the museum, our hope is not only they do they feel inspired and empowered and connected to us, but we want them to leave and think of what can I do differently in my life as a result of hearing not just his story of his presidency, but those upon whose shoulders he stands and he and Michelle Obama stand and what that meant and what we're doing going forward. And by the time it opens, we're gonna have thousands and thousands of young leaders around the world who've been through our leadership programs and they will be a part of his ever-growing legacy as well. And when they go forth and help change the world as a result of skills that they learned with us, that's a legacy. You know, and just like the other uh, presidential libraries, I mean, his, historians, what we do for a living is read other people's mail. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, so I'm very interested in seeing, for example, you're talking about hard things to do, the uh, Operation Neptune Spear and the killing of Osama bin Laden and the decision-making process for that. Um, and, you know, we have to wait till things get declassified, but they'll become available and we'll be able to reconstruct that event from of all perspectives, from, you know, the CIA to embassy perspectives, in country, out country. We'll be able to have a clear record of that. Uh, uh, another one of those major accomplishments, the Obama administration, which was getting justice um, in the right way after the the horror of the 9-11 attack on the United States. Can I give a shout out just to Doug and historians? Because I think a big piece of what you do is help each president build upon the presidents before in our history. And hopefully you don't make the same mistakes again if you're a really good student of history. And the whole point is to continue to move forward and to have someone with your talent and discipline and, and interest and engagement helping tell these stories. Um, I think prepares the next generation to not go backwards, but just 
pick up the baton and go forward. I'm going to just have to squeeze in one last question because I wanted to bring in both of the Obamas. And um, just as Barack Obama's 2004 speech kind of centered him for, for many of us in, Amer in American politics, Michelle Obama in 2016 at the DNC, when she said, when they go low, we go high. People have been speaking during Obama's presidency, will she run for president? I think that brought I can up answer that question. No, we know, I know, I know, that wasn't going to be my question. <laughs> but given that she won't, <laughs> and that the first lady of it, that Tina Chen also said. <laughs> but how will, how will President and Mrs. Obama um, continue to advance their goals? for public engagement and policy through the Obama Foundation? Look, they are two of the most popular people in the world, and they're also pretty young, and they want to use their platform to continue to be a force for good. And so both of them are looking for ways of predominantly reaching young people, although they certainly inspire older people too, to reach their full potential. And uh, they both often say, you know, it's hard to be what you can't see. Well, you can see them, and you can see, and people now know her story. They know his story. Both of them spoke at Hyde Park High School, which is a high school immediately across the street from the Presidential Center um, within the last year, and in an auditorium maybe three times this big. And it's a pretty poor black community. And to see all of these kids looking at the former president and first lady and asking them questions and realizing that their lives in origin were not that different than her life, maybe a little different than his being born in Hawaii, but certainly not that different from hers. And the, you know, the twists and turns and the vicissitudes of life that they both had had, their willingness to share that story so authentically and then help encourage and empower this next generation and give them the toolkits that they need to go forth and connect them to people so that their dreams become so much bigger than they would have been before. And M Michelle Obama, as I know Tina probably said, is particularly interested in girls and getting girls the quality of, ad of, of education that they need as adolescents, because we know that a, mayor, a major barrier to upward mobility is not having a good education, not just here in the United States, but around the world. So that's her special love. And looking at how we can use the center as an education tool, it's going to have a Chicago Public Library on the actual campus. That was so important to both Obamas, the importance of reading. And reading in the digital age is gonna be a little cooler and different than it might have been in a traditional library. But to build a campus, it's inviting to the community. And I say it's gonna be an economic engine and the pride of the south side of Chicago, but hopefully a beacon of hope to the world. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Doug. This has been amazing. We have a, a little bit of time for questions and we have two microphones here. Um, we'd like to encourage students if they uh, uh, could and also uh, our <laughs> colleagues and scholars. I think there's a student right behind you, Barbara, so maybe you could you let the first. student go first Thank and then you. you. Thank you. <laughs> if, um, student with a notebook. Can we let the two it. students go and then you? And then I promise, Barbara, we'll get to you. <laughs> we'll be okay. fast. Please, go ahead. These are both students in my Obama seminar. Yes. Go ahead, Dan. Could, Hello. <laughs> could you introduce yourself? Yes, well? I am Danny DiCrescenzo. I'm a junior audio radio major or poli sci minor from New Jersey. Thank you so much for being here. One of my clearest memories of Obama actually was his speech he gave the morning after the 2016 election. I watched it in full, I watched it alone. I didn't really understand what was going on, all I knew he wasn't happy. And my political socialization largely occurred after Obama left office. So I wanted to ask, because we didn't really discuss his legacy in terms of his successor, how should Obama's legacy be assessed given the ascent of a successor who was so diametrically opposed to what he did in the White House? Well, I, I, thank you for the question. Uh, I would view that there is such a thing as a, a kind of president's club from Washington all the way through um, Joe Biden, where there's a set of norms that are followed. And I don't think President Trump followed those norms. I don't think he's part of the president's club. But Obama showed that during the transition, all the right grace notes, he would, did what he could to help uh, President um, Trump get sea legs uh, early on. But I don't think it helps in, when, when we, you know, we have to treat our institutions sacredly in this country. We have to keep them honest, but to just do what we're doing in, in attacking federal workers and people that are, are working in, whether it's FBI or CIA or State Department and all, uh, it's, 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 an, it's an aberrant behavior of Trump. It, it's not the norm. And I think you're seeing Biden now back to 
there's not, you know, a, a more traditional way of, of behaving as president. If um, you watched and listened to his words, and I was in the Rose Garden, and, and if you want to Google, some photographer decided to take a photograph of the president's senior staff that day. And I saw the photographer, and I, I put on like my best face possible. And I really just looked like I lost my best friend. Um, we all did, and it was a very hard day. But what I remember most about what the president said, and believe me, if it was hard for me, it was really hard for him, because he understood that in the short term, his presidency um, could be eroded by his successor. Just as he signed a lot of executive orders on day one of his presidency that reversed much of what President Bush had done, and he knew that if the person he had supported, Hillary Clinton, didn't win, that the likelihood of that happening would go up. And so you're, which is part of why we spent so much time trying to look for legislative solutions, even though there was an uphill battle, because you know that executive orders can be reversed so quickly. And so it was a hard day for him, my point. And he said at that time, who said democracy is easy? It's always messy. You always take two steps forward and then a step back. And that what's important is who sustains it over time. And that's incumbent upon all of us. And so even on a really, really difficult day for him personally, he found that strength to talk about the long view and to remind us all about that arc and our role in pushing it forward. And I do think that we have returned now under President Biden to a more traditional role of president. Uh, but, but we also learned, I think, maybe most acutely during President um, Obama, that it isn't just the president. You need a legislative branch with whom you can work too. You need a judiciary that behaves responsibly. Those are important pillars of our institutions. And getting them all functioning well, that's up to us, us the people. So very briefly that night I was at I was the guest for Trevor Noah and the idea was they were positive. I, I showed up in the studio. They thought Hillary Clinton had won. So all their gags and sketches were about the first woman president. They had everything. I walked in and it looked like Trump was going to win and everybody there seemed so downcast. And then, uh, you know, he walked in and so we have no show. I won't, I can't do this. I said, wait a minute, because I'm too depressed to do the show. I said, well, what? He goes, no, well, I just don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. And I, now I'm getting scared. It's like, well, I'm, I was already scared to be on the show, you know? And, uh, and he said, it's nothing funny. I can't be funny. This is a comedy show and I don't find this funny. And then, then I, I offered a meek, well, I can be funny, maybe. <laughs> And he, said, and he said it with all earnest, please help me, please go for your story and be funny. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a night like you're mentioning, you'll remember forever. And it was a defining moment in American political history, for sure. Thank you. Laika. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Laika Jerome. And I just wanted to ask you a question regarding gun legislation. So I know Obama had some constraints, um, you know, enacting anything meaningful because he can't because he's the president. And obviously that would anything meaningful would come from the House and the Senate um, constructing legislation. So my question for you is being a part of his administration and witnessing how things have played out. What would you recommend to President Biden or future presidents? on ways to appeal or maneuver the House and the Senate to create and enact sustainable legislation addressing gun reform? And is that even possible due to the increase of political polarization on the Hill? Thank you. Such a good question and an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Thank you. <laughs> the worst day in eight years for me was um, the day that the 20 children and six adults were killed in Sandy Hook. And I say that in the context of us going to far too many memorial services while President Obama became, in a sense, the consoler in chief. And nothing was more frustrating as a parent, let alone as president, than to see the kind of gun violence we, are, we were and continue to suffer in our country when there are reasonable things that we could do to keep guns out of, a hand, out of the hands of people who are a threat to themselves or to each other. I mean, look, the, one of the little known facts is two thirds of the people who die from gun violence take their own lives. And so this is a health epidemic in our country. And the only way we're gonna get meaningful legislation is if we elect people who feel some accountability from the American people 
and are not um, adhering simply to special interest groups like the National Rifle Association. And there are far more people than, and, and most people, if you look at polling after Sandy Hook, 90% of the American people wanted us to close the loophole on background checks. Why would you not have a background check uh, on every single person who has access to a lethal weapon? Why in our country do we need to have assault weapons? Why do we need these magazines that can fire off a gazillion bullets in just no time at all? Why in civil society is that important? And it has become a political rallying cry. And the only way that changes is that if each and every one of us decides that we're gonna vote along those lines and, and make a decision that that's, that's what's most important to us and hold our elected officials accountable because if we don't hold them elect accountable, then special interests come in and they're willing to spend an enormous amount of money. And so in a sense, we all have to kind of ask ourselves our quest this question, you know, when is enough enough? Our children have to go through training in like you know, second grade on what to do if somebody comes in with a gun. That's, name me another country on earth that is going through this epidemic that we're going through, particularly other countries that are as successful as our country. And so it's a question we should all ask ourselves. It's like, what are we prepared to do to end this? Because it is not slowing down, it's getting worse. And as the, as the toxicity in the air becomes worse, people's inclination to go and reach for a very accessible gun just gets worse. And I will tell you, there are people in my hometown that say it is easier to get a gun than it is to get a book. That cannot be. We should do something about that. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Bruno. I'm coming from Dollar HU. Thank you for receiving us and coming to our school. And my question is regarding since this whole week has been observing and analyzing the Obama presidency and what the legacy of his, well, uh, of his cabinet was and his presidency as well. My question is, what do you believe is the Obama presidency's biggest le legacy legislative-wise or policy-wise, and do you believe this legacy has been upheld in the last two presidencies, being uh, Trump and Biden administrations? You want to answer first? Okay. Go ahead. You, know, you go ahead. I'm All curious right. well, what the historian thinks. Uh, <laughs> well, the, um, the, you know, I think the way that President Obama um, fought for democracy abroad um, made sure that we kept a, a international posture of strength, but also of making uh, proper decisions, prop, uh, prioritizing NATO, um, you, know, you know, trying to deal with the thorny issues of the Middle East. I think he, as a foreign policy president, is a very good record. Uh, I think on, um, I think that he wanted to do more on climate. Um, they did, you know, he, he brought climate to the table and started getting success, but like gun could reform, it's tough. Um, and, you know, we mentioned the, getting two Supreme Court justices on the court that are going to be there for, um, for a long um, time. But if I had to pick one, and we did the Affordable Care Act, however, I would say it was the way he pulled us out of the Great Recession. There are, are a, you know, these were real people suffering in real ways, and our country was spiraling out of and control our economy and President Obama did the right chess moves at the right time to uh, reconnect our economy and at the same time be able to do the Affordable Care Act and to do it all with this uh, a great civic spiritness of, um, of, of integrity in government. Yes, you can't just pick one. It's like, who's your favorite child? They're all important. Yeah. <laughs> they're, I only have one child, but they're all important. Um, uh, so much for my analogy. Um, I, look, when President Obama took office, millions of people were losing their jobs. Millions of people were losing their homes. And it was very unpopular to go forth and shore up the big banks. The big banks were considered the cause of the problem because they took risks with other people's money. And he recognized that if he didn't not just secure the banks, but put rules of the road in place so that they could not gamble with other people's money again, it could happen again. And also at the same time created the first ever consumer 
Financial Protection Agency, looking out for the consumer, nine different parts of government consolidated in one agency, only looking out for you as a consumer. And I think Doug's right. He, I mean, he, he um, used to keep a yellow pad of all of the things that he promised in the campaign so that he could cross them off with promises made, promises kept. But what that doesn't take into consideration is what happens that you don't control. And if you had asked him six months before the election, did he think he would have this economy in the tank? He would have said, no, we're going to go in there and we're going to you know, move forward with an affirmative agenda. And I think one of the strengths of the president is being able to move forward with your affirmative agenda at the same time as you have to respond to what comes your way. And that multitasking is the job. And we were talking earlier about we're in the middle of trying to get something done and then suddenly the Gulf, of, uh, Gulf erupts with oil and now we're spending a lot of time trying to contain that. And, and that's what the job. And that I think calibrating and learning how to do that and showing the American people that you can do all that with a really competent team around you and not making this about you. And I think that has to be um, the core quality of every public servant. It's not about you, it's about what you do in service. Add just one thing very briefly, it's not quite to what you're, your question, but as a historian, I love the way President Obama opened up our American narrative. Uh, and we're talking about not, not just gender equality, working in the federal government and working, appointing more women than anybody, but opening up women's history in new ways, saving the the plays, the um, underground railroad sites of Harriet Tubman, uh, dealing with the history, rich history of, of Latinos in America, um, with national monuments, um, you know, opening LGBTQ rights at Stonewall here in New York, adding the understanding of, of, of the gay pride movement into the National Park Service, you know, it was the opening of, of um, you know, what, what our narrative. We were very close before Obama and he was able to start telling us it's okay to, you know, honor all sorts of different Americans in different ways. And uh, I really appreciated that as a historian that he took that approach of, of building on our narrative and opening it up and teaching people about voices that have, haven't have been given the recognition in the American history textbooks. I think it'd be fair to say, tell me, Doug, if you agree, that every, all of his major accomplishments were to make our country more equal, more fair, more just. And that, that if that's your litmus test, that's a good true north. And so if you look, if you look at the long, long list, and at your age, you might not even know that when President Obama took office, same-sex marriage was only legal in two states. In 2008, by the time the marriage equality came to the Supreme Court, it was 37 states in the District of Columbia. You might say, well, my goodness, that was a lot that got done in seven years. No, decades of work, state by state by state, led to that. And so, Back to my earlier point, change takes time. And having a president who's willing to, to realize that it may not all happen on his watch. And I will say there's a lot of unfinished business. We did not get criminal justice reform. We did not get immigration reform. We did not get the kind of gun legislation that we wanted. But you run as hard and as fast as you can, and then you give the baton to the next person, and then the next person, and then the next person. And that's how democracies work. Uh, yes, but returning to my the second part of my question. I, I think we're going we're to have to stop there, okay? Well, thank you, though. Oh, thank you. I, I have to say, um, our con because we, we, we are punctual. It's Don't leave. We'll ask, come up afterwards when we're done, and we'll, we'll answer your question. Not of now. Course. Thank you. Program's <laughs> over, but we'll talk to you afterwards. Oh, thank you. Well, our conference on the Obama presidency... <laughs> Our conference concludes, but the Obama administration's legacy, the Obama Foundation's work, and the inspiration of the Obamas all continue. Please join me in thanking again. Thank you, Doug. Thank wonderful. you.